This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Thank you for joining us today. With me is John Cameron in the middle and special friend of the show, Kalish Morrow, down there at the end. Kalish, we owe you a congratulations the last yay, time you were with us. Yay, you were a candidate for, for a city council, <laughs> and you are now a city councilwoman. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. And they threw you right into the fire. The world did not get simpler did, once you became a <laughs> city no, council member, did it? Yeah. And then, of course, on top of all the, you know, the craziness, which, I mean, I, I obviously knew that before I got sworn in how crazy it would be. But then, of course, there's always like other things that are going on, uh, you know, with the city and stuff. And you start to learn about things. And, yeah, it's always all, all crazy. And I'm sure we're no different than any other city when it comes to that stuff. But, yeah, fire, fire, uh, trial by fire for sure. Yeah, it's like might as well have turned the fire alarm as you got elected. I kind of know how that feels. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a report uh, this last week that state scientists say Governor Newsom isn't using science in his lockdown decisions. I guess there's some scientists in the state who have, are just saying they're not look, taking a holistic approach when they view the science. They're taking a very narrow view of the science and then making decisions based upon this narrow view. So what have you kind of seen down in uh, Hanford? Um, I mean, we've been... Yeah, you know, we're under the same purple tier, complete lockdown as everybody else. Um, here in Hanford, though, we've we've kind of done what we would call like a whisper campaign. So we've basically told businesses that we aren't personally going to go out and enforce anything if you choose to be open. But the, um, the arbitrary rule of you're not essential applies to your business. Um, <clears throat> We're just encouraging businesses to go and, you know, contact lawyers so that they're kind of at the ready and they can get, you know, find out what, what the full repercussions could be and if the state can come down on them, that kind of thing. Um, my first night I got sworn in, I was able to get unanimous um, support to agendize at our next meeting, which will be um, next week, to discuss claim, uh, calling all businesses essential. Um, that really, it's more ceremonial. It doesn't change any kind of enforcement or anything like that, but it just makes a very broad statement um, backing our businesses here that we we feel that you're essential, that your your paychecks are essential, that keeping a roof over your head is essential. You know, the, this whole, like, again, this arbitrary rule of what's essential and not essential, it's just, it, in, it goes back to what you're just talking about. The, the, the it's not based on science. We were just at a conference uh, this weekend for reopen Cal dot uh, reopen Cal now, and we had a whole panel of multiple panels of doctors, epidemiologists, uh, economists, all these people to take a holistic view of what's going on here in the state. Um, you know, and, and across the nation, across the world, and you know, discuss their discoveries and how. You know these lockdowns aren't working. What we could be doing better, um, but yet he's he hasn't been taking a holistic approach, and he's got people so fearful that they've got this myopic view of just COVID. And I made a statement the other day, uh, just you know, all deaths matter because he's just put, focusing on COVID deaths, but opioid, uh, um, not opioid, but addiction rates are going through the roof. Overdoses, we've got suicides on the uh, that have exploded you know we're, we're basically trading a life for a life and also just destroying families and and businesses in the wake of it yeah i know john has this anti john is going to about to go on an anti-science rant so we can go ahead and have some coffee i'm going on a pro-science <laughs> anti-lockdown rant <laughs> so uh but one of the things i want to bring up you said you went to that conference and huh? there was a rally on the capitol do you know how many people attended the rally Ooh, that, um, I would say we're, if I have to guess, it's about, or about 100 or so. There was, uh, we all came directly from the conference, which was out in Rancho Murrieta. Cool. Uh, we took a bus over there. It was, we, I don't know the number of electeds, and that was, that was kind of the point of it, too. It was, uh, it was really for electeds from up and down the state. Uh, county supervisors, we had city council members, mayors, uh, sheriffs, mm -hmm. people like that. So the, no, that's the that's the the conference. But I'm talking about how many people attended the rally. How many common citizens were there? Right. So like we went over there, we had people from the conference too that were you know more more citizens, politico types. And when we got there, it's, it's just it was it was the weirdest 
most organized protest I've ever been at, rally that we've ever been at. We had to have wristbands to get in through the gates. We had, you know, all the, the, the armed CHP and riot gear all around us, but they weren't facing us. They were facing out. And the people who came out uh, that, that weren't part of the conference that didn't, you know, get the wristbands and all that, they were way back behind like a barricade, <laughs> these gates. Uh, but there was a good, you know, 30 or 40 people that were out there, too, that came out to support the, the rally and and uh, and, you know, cheer it on. Hmm. OK, but there was more people outside than inside, do you think? Uh, kind of about the same, roughly about the same. Okay. So, yeah, I'd say maybe about 100 people. All right. I, yeah, I was going to go and then I decided not to because I was lazy, basically. I, I have I have no excuse. My knee hurt. I didn't want to stand around outside and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, the, back, to, back to back to the science, the uh, Barrington Project. I don't know if you're familiar with it, Khalees, something to look at. The three of the top epidemiologists in the world, one from uh, from Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, I don't remember which one, one from Harvard, one from Stanford have started this this organization that said that's called the Barrington Project because they met at uh, this Barrington College, which of course the uh, the socialists, I don't call them liberals, the socialists said, oh no, no, it's a libertarian college. Is there a right leaning college? You can't pay any attention to anything people said. They said flat out um, that uh, the lockdowns don't work. The CDC has said lockdowns don't work. The World Health Organizations had said lockdowns don't work. The, there is, um, because of what we're doing in, in uh, first world countries, there's something like probably by now 200 million people in poorer countries have been pushed into the worst form of poverty, which is existing on less than two, $2 a day. And something like 50 million of them will die before the year is out as a result of us uh, mismanaging the pandemic. So the government's one size fits none approach um, that is is crazy. And if I were if I were a conspiracy theorist, I would say it's much easier to to pass a socialist agenda uh, where you spend money hand over fist and put all these regulations and programs in place uh, when people aren't allowed to leave their homes to congregate to talk, uh, when they don't have jobs and they're made fearful by it, where you're scaring the hell out of them with really bad numbers on something which basically people in hospitals are now calling this fluvid. That these are people who doctors and nurses and and lab techs and all the rest of that are calling it the fluvid, F L U V I D, because they know that of the 20 million or so people that have actually uh, been tested in this country to have, is it 20 million? Eh, less than that. Uh, I'll have to look at the latest numbers. There's 10 times that many people that have actually had the thing and showed either no symptoms or so mild the symptoms they didn't go to the doctor. So this, I'm not saying as much ado about nothing because people have died, but very few people, anyway, the number of people we're killing worldwide by our, by our response to something, which isn't nearly as serious a threat as it's made out to be by the government, is much greater than the number of people killed by that thing. And, and Governor Newsom, once you let these freaks in major political positions assume power, they're not going to give it up. They love this, this control. They don't care whether people are dying of starvation in the streets, whether farms collapse, whether companies go out of business, whether restaurants never reopen. They have no compunction whatsoever for those people's lives as long as they can maintain the power that they've grabbed during this thing. Okay, I'm off my soapbox now. Well, we'll talk about the, the WHO and some science. The WHO's weight, uh, methodology for counting death, if we use the WHO's methodology as singapore does we would have two-thirds less official COVID deaths mm -hmm. it'd be around a hundred thousand which is right about the yearly flu deaths mm -hmm. but we we have this such an aggressive count and i don't know which way is right because we haven't had the discussion about the plus cons pluses and pros and cons of each methodology but if we, we have such an aggra aggressive count that we may be actually overestimating how many people are dying mm -hmm. from COVID. it's a it's a discussion we haven't had and that's really the problem 
is yeah. we haven't had the discussion yeah. about which counting methodology is best. Well, then just to add something to that, you know that that it's in it's in hospitals just like when the the um, AIDS epidemic hit. Um, it was a, a terrible thing. It's still a terrible thing in much of the world, although there are medicines we keep it in check in first world countries. Uh, hospitals, medical uh, organizations, and medical insurance companies were being paid, you know, based upon the AIDS patients. Hospitals are being paid, they're being reimbursed for people that they can identify as COVID. So anytime you pay people, you reward a certain behavior. They're going to report those people as COVID. So anyway, it's probably time to move on from that because we could rant about this thing forever. And until yeah. we force the people in power to give up their power, it's going to be this way. And I actually Ooh. have it. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Kalish. Oh, I was going to have one final note, too, because uh, yeah. what was interesting about this conference, too, um, and I, I, I'll have to maybe I'll post the uh, the link in the comments later on. But um, they the health organization there was not health or uh, health department there was trying to completely thwart our conference. Um, and then they were coming back uh, saying that they were going to come down heavy on the hotel that was hosting, you know, letting us stay yeah. there because yeah. it, they could only have people there that are there for essential activities or whatever. So they were basically trying to say that electeds up and down the state who are going to that conference to get a holistic education on COVID and the response to COVID being non-essential. Yeah. And so Jeff Hewitt, uh, you know, our libertarian uh, poster child, uh, who's a supervisor down in uh, Riverside who helped put this whole thing on, uh, responded with, well, if we're not essential, then who is? And then of mm. course, you know, well, then we should just shut down all government if we're not essential. So. Yes, yes, <laughs> sorry, you lose your new job, but yes. Yeah, done. I, can, I can retire from, uh, from politics then. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. <laughs> but I, that, I'm going to skip over. We were going to, I was going to go to something else, but an armed consumer affairs cops were raided the Stockton saloon. And why are consumer salon. affairs police armed? Salon. Salon. A uh, saloon. Salon. Hey. 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 salon makes it more interesting. Though. Hey. Yeah. Saloon makes it more interesting. It's and, only for me yeah. guys. Come and, on now. Uh, <laughs> I, I think the reason they're not raiding saloons is they, they know they'd get hurt because you know, people are a little frustrated. <laughs> But if you know you're showing up at a place where somebody's getting their hair colored or their nails done, probably less chance of dying. Yeah. yeah. I mean, why are they coming with? Why does the Consumer Affairs have an armed police department? Why does the EPA have armed police? Why does the Forestry Service have a SWAT team? Why? I mean, why do they have tanks at the local police? It's the militarization of a bunch of organizations which aren't even constitutionally viable. There is nothing in the constitution that says you can create this board, give it power over people's property and arm them and they can make up their own rules that have the way to law. I mean, it's, it's happening everywhere and it's insane. Yeah, it, it is really insane. And speaking of insane, we're gonna go ahead and move on because I wanna know what Kalish wants to know about this because as a party official, the Secretary of State asserts the vast discretion to provide voter information, registration information, based upon the reasonable belief that is being requested for unlawful, false, or fraudulent purposes. But in a single party state where we have the Secretary of State essentially deciding who gets to have access to voter data, is that's dangerous, is it not? I mean, because we can have, getting access to voter data is expensive anyway. And so this is a, another barrier that, uh, I'm just afraid they're gonna misuse it. I mean, that would, yeah, go ahead, Kalisha. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, as they keep creating more and more of these regulations, it just makes it harder and harder to, it, it definitely gets in the way of democracy. And um, yeah, as you well know, it, you know, ballot access and all these different things have been weaponized against us. I could see this as being another way to weaponize um you know, weaponize against a third party or, or at this point, like you said, we're, we're kind of more at a one party rule in this state. You know, they, they, they can maintain that, that ruling over, over the people. Um, this is all new kind of news to me. So I was doing my homework first thing in the morning here, uh, reading through the articles and stuff, but yeah, I, I, anytime so, that they would impose any more regulations like that, it always gives me pause for concern. No, the, well, we never, you, yeah, I'm sorry, John. It, it just seems to me that giving this much power into the uh, 
into the the hands of an elected official seems kind of backwards where you're having an elected party official getting to declare that hey you know especially today where we're actually trying to declare one of the political parties essentially an outlaw organization you know can we just decide well you're a member of that party we don't like that party so therefore you can't have access to the voter data and then you can't have access to the public and what are you going to do i mean how are you supposed to have the same type of outreach that the major party would have it's it's already a problem because you know i was never going to be able to afford it so we kind of figure out how to operate without the kind of voter data but if you were running a more traditional campaign you might need that and it's a strange i don't know it's it i read that and it concerned me and so that's kind of why i brought it up it's, it doesn't seem to me like we're discussing this concerns the heck out of me i'm i'm not again i'm not in politics i'm all about politics but unlike you two who have actually spent the time and effort to get involved and do something i chose to you know go about trying to make a contribution in a different way uh fundraising for an organization that sued the government to pre protect the constitution which despite being a libertarian i i really like i think you need to have a real simple set of rules and then follow those and and all this other stuff they've added the hundreds and thousands of pages of regulations they need to flush down a toilet but so you were saying that it costs you money to access this voter information how much money oh i don't know because depending upon how which county you get it from to get the county voter registration data it would have cost us like two grand to get just sacramento county that's not even counting yeah. yellow counties so and depending upon how much you want it sorted and versus the, all the various there's the whole there's a whole shopping cart list of things you can get <laughs> your voter data from. So now, I could have borrowed voter data from somebody else who had like generic data. Mm -hmm. I just didn't. We figured out a way around it. But so my they, question is, you're you you you're a tech guy. You used to be mm -hmm. a tech guy. I think you're still a tech guy. So they don't even they don't give you the data and let you massage it yourself. That you have to request it in a certain way from them, so they can basically present it how you want or can you get the the raw data and massage it however you want like run it through excel or numbers yeah, you can get the raw data but they can they have the ability to set it up in like precincts and walking districts and so they can they can do it set or sort it all for you mm -hmm. and, and essentially you can save time and money if right. they do it okay and which is cool. fine it's great it's actually i don't necessarily mind that you, but it's expensive and so yeah. it if you're going to set up now, not only do you have to go through that expense part and deal with it, but now you have to ask for approval. Yeah. Not just well, being a, a qualified candidate isn't enough. A member of the party isn't enough. You have to go, oh, please, Carl, sir, can I have some more? You know, no, that, <laughs> is, is that what they're going to do or what they've already done? It's what they're talking about doing. They actually, right. so what, the way I read, the only article I read on it, and I sped read that, if that's a word, <laughs> speed read it. I don't know how you say that. Um, it said that that um, there there's so much vagueness in the language; it's not legal definition. So you could decide, and it's there. They can deny the voter data if they believe somebody's going to use it for to commit fraud or for illegal means or to rabble rouse or all the rest of this stuff. They could basically deny anybody voter data that they didn't want by making up oh yeah yeah he's going to use it to incite a riot that's why he's doing it yeah. you know he's evil so that's a problem and and the the problem is 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 even deeper in that um you know this is a state that doesn't require people to id themselves when they vote yet they're going to keep the information about those people who weren't required to present an ID to vote from people unless they go through this, uh, jump through this political hoop. So anybody who looks at what's going on and doesn't come to the conclusion that somebody is trying to manipulate the outcome of elections is stupid because that's the total and complete purpose of this thing is to further manipulate the outcome of elections. Yeah, I think it's it's one of those things. It's where you start just tossing pennies on the scale, you know. Over time, the scale is going to be vastly weighted into your favor, but yeah. you know you don't notice it one one little weight at a time. And so th there was an article about um, we were talking about the rise of drug abuse and drug overdose and mm -hmm. suicides, 
And the original formulation, there was an article and there's a supposition that the original formulation of Oxycontin was not actually the, didn't create the opioid crisis. The psychiatrist, she said that it, and the removing from the market isn't going to make it go away, that the real problem is people's undealt with pain, whether it's psychological or physical, mm -hmm. and that having the government restrict access to opioids actually is counterproductive. Mm -hmm. And for me, as a person, as someone who's kind of gone through the medical issues in, in the last 15 years, is 15 years ago, I could get easily, if you go in there, my knees hurt, they would throw you. They would simply throw you uh, painkillers. Mm -hmm. And now... You can't get painkillers to save your life. I don't want you can them. to save your life, but just short of that. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm getting ready to get a, get a surgery. I'm, I have, uh, I'm an ex paratrooper and because of my back and my knee, uh, which I fought through for years and years and years, I actually have a little disability from the veteran veterans mm -hmm. administration. And, and, um, five years ago, my doctor prescribed me morphine for my back. I had little morphine pills I could take. New doctor moved to nowadays for for a back that's basically, you know, would prevent a person who wasn't crazy from doing the things that I do, but I just put up with pain. Um, I was given like a year's supply of Vicodin, and it was 12, 12 Vicodin for, I think, a year. Um, so the idea that you know, before we can deal with these people's pain, but now they need to suffer is, is weird. The other thing that it's done is pushed a whole bunch of people who were basically habituated to Vicodin and Oxycontin and all the rest of that, couldn't get it. They cut them off. What are they going to do? They're going to go buy morphine or heroin or something on the street. <coughs> They're going to have to deal with criminals they're going to spend money they don't have they're going to have to go get that money somewhere probably by selling either drugs or themselves or breaking into pharmacy so you know as a libertarian i say if somebody wants to take a drug sell it to them over the counter just as if it was a loaf of bread and if they're an adult let them make the decision how they're going to use it if they want to sit in front of the tv well never mind if they're sitting in front of the TV, they don't need morphine because they're frying their brain anyway. But um, anyway, that's, it's, you know, blaming a drug for a drug problem is like blaming highway deaths on cars. It's just, it's crazy. And, and well, 20 years ago, you couldn't, the doctors didn't want to prescribe pain medicine. So the government stepped in and said, you need to prescribe pain medicine. You need to take care of people's pain better. So yeah. the doctors started prescribing people's pain medicine. And now they said, you're over prescribing pain medicines. We have to crack down on the uh, on, on opioids and pain medicines. So they cracked down on opioids and pain medicines. And now we have a, uh, now we have a drug abuse problem in our streets. Mm -hmm. And no one wants to go say, you know, the original sin was actually interfering with the medical procedures in the first place. Yeah. I mean, if, and, if, yeah. It's, you know, no one wants to go back to the original sin. And I think that's, that's kind of the problem that we've got. You got anything on that, Kalisha, or you just kind of, we kind of covered everything there for you? Yeah, I think that, you know, we, I would start getting into more of like the war on drugs and the failed war on drugs and how that's just basically created all the issues that we have, including cartels. And, you know, it just blows up from there. But, you know, it's, it's, I think that, Obviously, the decriminalization of drugs will be, uh, you know, beneficial in the fighting this opioid crisis. And, um, you know, I'm excited about all these different um, cannabis dispensaries to open up because, like, I've got I've got aches and pains and stuff. I had rheumatoid arthritis when I was a kid, and um, so when it gets cold weather like this, everything starts hurting, and I have a hard time sleeping. And I could go take a gummy or, or take a hit off a vape, a vape pen. You know, you don't have to go load up a freaking bowl or anything like that. They just made it really easy. I can take that. I sleep comfortably. And then I'm not in this fog like I do when I take a, like an Advil PM or something like that. But, you know, so yeah, yeah. anyway, I can just go down this whole like other road. <laughs> yeah, well, it, this whole failed, the failed mindset of the drug war is I think is kind of what caused this whole thing. It's like we always escalate these things. And rather than you know, take a step back and say, hey, what do we actually do to cause this? We're just going to do more things that are going to make it worse. We're I have just an gonna... idea. Yes, One Mr. John. One of my crazy ideas, Kalisha, as you get to know me, you'll know that I have a lot of them. Um, <laughs> so the war, okay. on, the war on drugs created the drug problem, drug cartels, powerful prison unions, put uh, one out of nine young black men in jail, on and on and on and on and on. 
the war on poverty increased uh, the the uh, because of the way people's behaviors were rewarded, increased single family households in this country to an astronomical level and forced again primarily black males out of households. So I suggest that we support the the socialists in declaring a war on freedom and a war on, <laughs> on self-awareness uh, and a war on uh, and a, a war against any regulation being removed from the government. If, if they're a successful in their war against freedom, every single citizen in this country will be a libertarian within a week and we can stop even having this show. So please <laughs> ask Biden and company, uh, the Sleepy Joe and I can't even <laughs> yeah, say yeah, we'll, name. We'll, we'll, we'll save you on that one, Darby. We'll yeah, Sleepy out. Joe and Sleepy Joe and the and her th and and his thug female sidekick. Um, please <laughs> declare a, a government. Uh, it's like the race to the moon, only but crush all freedom in the country, and and freedom will yeah. sprout everywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. Imagine it the other way, John. Hmm? <laughs> John That's my idea. Yeah. I got to view it the other way. Maybe we should stop having wars on things. It well, seems yeah, to me. They, you know they're yeah. not going to because they love the <laughs> war on poverty. Let's declare war on drugs. But we've yeah. already declared war on sanity because you elected us. Yeah. It seems to me like war seems to, you know, hurt people and break things. So why well, do we keep, why do we continually use war as a as kind of a euphemism when we have an issue to state. Mm -hmm. So so we gotta create a war. So we're gonna hurt people and break things to solve problems. That doesn't seem like we're solving problems. It, yeah. it seems like we're we're kind of satisfying our emotions. Yeah. We're not Maybe. actually dealing with the underlying issues. We're not trying to solve actual problems. We just want to make ourselves feel better. Yeah. And I think you know if we look out in the world today we see far too much of that. Yeah. And we've yeah, got too. about the 30 seconds a minute left. Kalish, is there anything you want anybody out there to know? Are we kind of around at the show? Oh boy, uh, nothing that I can I can sum up in about five seconds. But yeah, you know, I'm happy to be back on here and have great discussions with you guys. Well, we're happy to have you. We want to thank you for coming in on the kind of the late notice. I gave you some late notice, so you did us a big, huge favor for showing up here today. And I thank you for oh, for, showing up, for yeah. showing up. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't say that because then you'll that'll actually happen. I'll start calling you more often. And John, thank you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank, thank you for Kalish, pleasure. Congratulations again. It's 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 wonderful to see the grassroots libertarian movement chipping away. And uh, you know, that's that's the way the socialists did it. And and uh, so let's take a page out of their non-war book and uh, and and get some wins here. Because you know, if if you take the labels off, seventy percent of the population of this country would self-identify as libertarian. And we just have to get the word out that that we're interested in fiscal responsibility and less regulation and freedom. And, and, it's and we're ending happen. with that, John. Thank you all for coming from all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint. Please remember to love everybody. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook.